Richard I succeeded his father as King of England in 1189. Henry II had died a worn out and defeated man, exhausted from years of fighting with his own sons. Henry the Young King, the oldest of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine's children, had died in 1183, aged just 28. He had been spurred on not only by his mother, but also by the King of France, Louis the Seventh, to rebel against Henry. Louis was still embittered by Eleanor's divorcing of him to only then go and marry Henry in 1152, shortly before he became King of England. It had been a tremendous blow to both his pride and prestige and made matters politically very dangerous for the French King. So presented with an opportunity to stir up trouble in England, Louis took it. Eleanor herself had been sidelined by Henry in their marriage. Having done her duty and produced for the king the required heirs and spares to secure his dynasty, Henry had started to take mistresses, with Eleanor moving past her prime, and with Henry still a relatively young man and over a decade younger than her. This did not please her in the slightest, and it said that she had Henry's most well-known mistress, a young woman by the name of Rosamond, murdered. But that wasn't her most damaging action. Knowing her sons were chomping at the bit, under their father's suffocating grip on power, she incited them into open rebellion. It would cause tremendous harm to Henry's reign. And when he heard who was the real mastermind behind the boy's revolt, he was absolutely furious and had Eleanor thrown into prison. She was only released on the death of Henry II in 1189. It was Richard who had released Eleanor from her captivity. Richard was her favourite out of all her children, and she would play a key role in not only his reign, but also in the reign of her youngest son, John, up until shortly before her death, aged 80 in 1204. Eleanor's role was particularly important during the reign of Richard I as she took charge of administrative matters, with Richard spending very little time in England during his decade-long reign. <clears throat> At Richard's coronation, all the key nobility were there from throughout the Ajambin Empire, including the brilliant knight William Marshall. Said to be the only man Richard was ever afraid of, William had come face to face with Richard during one of Richard's rebellions against Henry II. Having unseated Richard from his horse, William now had the prince at his mercy. With Richard pleading for his life, William said he would spare him, as he was always going to do. After all, Richard was still the son of a king, no matter how troublesome he had been for the crown. But as a warning to Richard, Marshall drove a spear into the horse he had fallen from. This must have had a tremendous impact on Richard and his ideas on chivalry. And it had also brought into stark contrast the loyalties to the crown demonstrated by William Marshall throughout his brilliant career and the lack of it shown by Richard and his brothers. At the coronation, Richard was stripped down to basic clothing and instead dressed in fine royal regalia, including golden sandals, a tunic, golden spurs, and then finally, a royal cloak. He was anointed king, and in his hand was placed a symbol of the justice he was to wield in his kingdom before he was made to swear oaths of good kingship, and then finally, he was crowned king of England. There is, sadly, a terrible tale to be told from the coronation of Richard I. After the end of the celebration feast, some members of the Jewish community had come to pay homage to the new king. Richard had expressly forbidden, it, forbidden this and had banned that any Jews from attending. The result was that the Jews were seized violently, flogged and beaten viciously, with some done to the point of death and others actually being killed. One man was so badly treated that he accepted forced conversion before later being allowed to return to his original faith. It was a sad and terrible start to the reign 
and the violence had spread throughout London, with some of the citizens using it as an, an excuse to demonstrate their own rabid anti-Semitism, and had inflicted great misery on the Jewish communities in London. There was some repression of the violence, with some being hanged for their roles, but not for anything that had happened to the Jews, but for the consequences that had been felt by the Christians, such as fires that had been started in Jewish areas, but had spread to other areas of London, with houses of Christians being burnt to the ground. It's certainly not for the first time a coronation in English history had gone wrong. For this, see the coronation of William the Conqueror, but it's certainly one of the most repugnant. How responsible was Richard for the spreading of the violence is difficult to say, but he certainly played a part in the abuse given to the Jewish community who had arrived at the banquet. It's situations like this that you have to remember to keep the context of the time in mind, but it's still hard to not feel sympathy for the people involved, and it's another example in a long line of them of violence against Jewish people in medieval history. Shortly after his coronation, Richard had homage paid to him by the King of Scotland, William the Lion, at Canterbury. Meanwhile, Eleanor had banned a foreign cardinal from meeting the King as he had entered the country without the King's permission, and was thus ordered to remain with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Elsewhere, Richard's brother John came whinging to the king as he had been placed under interdict, and not for the last time, because of his marriage to Isabella of Gloucester. This was overturned, and John would eventually divorce Isabella and marry again. Two years prior to Richard's succession, Jerusalem had fallen to Saladin, and his Muslim forces. The news of this catastrophe had made its way back to the Christian West, where the cause of a crusade was taken up by Richard I and King Philip II of France. Crusading would not prove to be cheap, and even though Richard had inherited a reasonably healthy financial state of affairs, further money was required, and in some cases, it was gathered by any means necessary. Taxes were imposed and collected with such brute force that it caused great fear across the country. Philip and Richard attempted to agree to a treaty with Richard recognising Philip as his overlord, but this would prove to be unenforceable. As had been the case when Pope Urban II had preached the First Crusade nearly a century earlier, a great energy was whipped up across Europe, and like the First Crusade, Jewish communities were the first to be on the receiving end of it, with a series of slaughters taking place across England, in places as far apart as Norwich and York. The actions are condemned by the Chronicles, and attempts were made to prevent the slaughters, but during the religious fervour of Crusades, Spending the winter in Sicily, it wasn't long before Richard I and Philip II were arguing amongst themselves. That agreement that had been reached for Richard to treat Philip as his overlord, whilst on crusade together, had begun to unravel in very quick fashion. One of the first major issues occurred when it became clear that the French king had been in communications with Tancred, king of Sicily, about Richard. Tancred presented the letters that had been sent to him, and it appeared to prove Philip's duplicity. He had implied to Tancred that the English king would cause him nothing but trouble in Sicily. When Richard had proved that that wasn't the case, he won over the trust of Tancred, who in turn alerted him to Philip's untrustworthiness. Unsurprisingly, Richard was not amused by this, and great tension arose between the two. Philip attempted to clear himself of the charges, but Richard refused to accept any claims of innocence, and instead broke off his arranged marriage 
with Philip's sister, Alice. Instead, Richard arranged a marriage with the daughter of the King of Navarre named Berengaria. Richard's mother, Eleanor, once again proved her worth as she went to collect the young woman and brought her to Richard so the two could be married. The marriage was hardly an overwhelming success, however. The two barely saw each other, with Berengaria probably never even setting foot in England, and the two would produce no heirs, which would prove fateful in the extreme. Departing from Sicily, Richard landed on the island of Cyprus. His welcome there was far from hospitable, and the ruler of the island decided to attack Richard's fleet, and in doing so, caused great damage. Richard's journey to the Holy Land was proving to be far from straightforward. Richard responded swiftly, soon bringing the troublesome Duke into submission and taking hostage his daughter, whom he left with Eleanor and Berengaria. A treaty was agreed and Richard had conquered Cyprus, although this hadn't exactly been a part of his initial plans. Richard then finally reached Acre in the middle of 1191. The Muslims there were being besieged by the Christians who had been joined by Philip II around Easter of 1191. The Muslim ruler Saladin had sent a small fleet to the aid of the defenders of Acre, but before it could reach them, they were accosted by the King of England. The Muslim ships were overwhelmed by Richard and most of its crew were thrown into the sea. And after this success, Richard made his way to the port of Acre, where he was greeted by great enthusiasm from the Christian army and great despair by the Muslims in the city of Acre. Eventually, the city surrendered, with a deal being arranged. Saladin was to return to the Christians around 1,500 captives he had taken, as well as restoring them the supposed true cross. However, it seemed that Saladin reneged on his promise, and Richard again demonstrated his brutal side. Over 2,000 Muslims were executed, and some of their key nobility were put in chains and imprisoned. After this, Philip decided to slip off, despite the best efforts of Richard to make him stay. It seems fairly clear here that Philip had always had in mind to return home fairly quickly. With Richard preoccupied in the Middle East, <clears throat> the Ashavin Empire had never looked more vulnerable, and Philip absolutely would have been aware of this. Having supposedly done his bit, in overseeing the capture of Acre, he left and departed for France, and would use Richard's brother John to cause great strife in the West, whilst Richard could do absolutely nothing about it. Richard too must have suspected that foul play would be taking place in his absence, but despite this obvious antagonism from Philip, he remained in the Middle East and would firmly establish himself as one of the great warrior kings of his age and strike fear into Muslims everywhere. In the early autumn of 1191, Richard and his men faced off against Saladin at Arsuf. The battle looked to be heading for a disaster before the intervention of first the Knights Hospitaller and then Richard himself. Not fearing death, the hospital Hospitaller Knights launched a counter-attack, which was something that Richard had not been expecting, and they drove the Muslim forces back. Richard then threw himself into the middle of the battle and fought with such ferocity that he is said to have been berserk. He struck at every enemy side, cutting a wide path around him, and absolutely was impressive, irrepressible in his progress. It proved to be an absolute rout. The Muslims had now felt the full force of Richard the Lionheart, and generations of young children would be told 
for their misbehaviour. If you don't behave, the King of England will get you. Into 1192, Richard can turn, continued to turn the tide against Saladin. He recaptured Darum from the Muslims, taking over 5,000 prisoners, and from there landed at Jafar. Although he was militarily outnumbered, this didn't prevent Richard once again engaging Saladin's forces in battle and wiped out the majority of the enemy. The gains that Saladin had made for his own empire before the Third Crusade had almost been entirely reversed, and it's largely due to the military might and brilliance of Richard I. He and his men arrived at Jerusalem, but despite the pleas of some, Richard would make no attempt to recapture the Holy City. Why? Richard must have calculated that his forces were simply not strong enough in either numbers nor physical strength and after a long and draining war to make such an effort. You wondered here if he rued Philip's rather weak decision to leave after Acre. You also must wonder what Saladin had made of the events of the Third Crusade. He was, after all, one of the great generals of his generation, and in his own right, he had made significant and widespread conquests. But he had encountered a unique and brilliant foe. Richard had stormed into battle in a way completely unique for a king, disregarding his own safety and inspiring his forces in hostile conditions that were as physically demanding as you could possibly imagine. Saladin died the following year and must have cursed and perhaps begrudgingly admired Richard the Lionheart. As for Richard, although he departed the Holy Land, this did not mean he would have an easy journey home and there were now other enemies lying in wait. In October 1192, Richard I made his departure from the Holy Land and headed back to Europe. As he made his way back to the West, conditions for travel would have gradually worsened. However, once he reached Austria, Richard had far bigger things to worry about than the weather, as he was captured and taken prisoner by the Archduke of Austria, Leopold. Despite the awesome accomplishments Richard had made on the crusade, which his captors would have been well aware of, he was not treated with the due respect a man of his stature warranted. He was verbally abused and his captors are said to have behaved in a manner worse than animals. Archduke Leopold then handed over the English king to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI. Leopold earned handsomely from the deal. Richard was held in a rather obscure German castle, specifically built for the purposes of holding enemies of the Holy Roman Empire. On hearing the news of the king's imprisonment, his brother, John, started his designs on becoming king, and so endeavoured to ensure that Richard remained stuck in Germany as long as possible, if not indefinitely. The emperor was demanding a huge ransom, so the possibility of Richard's remaining a captive for a long period was quite a strong one, and John had every intention of making the most of the situation, strengthening his own castles and winning over allies to his cause. John then went to France to visit Philip II, another man who stood to gain from Richard's predicament. For John to claim the throne, he didn't just have to usurp Richard, but also had to deal with Arthur, Duke of Brittany, who, with Richard having no children, was heir to the English throne. Arthur was the son of Geoffrey, Richard and John's other brother, and the third son of Henry II. With no heirs for Richard, the succession had passed to the next brother, Geoffrey, who, having died, the succession then passed on to his eldest son, Arthur, and not the youngest of the brothers, John. However, 
This didn't seem to matter even a tiny bit to John. And as I shall talk about on my video on John, the lengths he'd go to to secure power would in the end prove to be quite despicable. For the time being, he made a deal with the French king to ensure that Arthur would be disinherited in the event of Richard not returning. Richard himself still attempted to govern his kingdom even whilst in prison. He ordered the bishops of England to convene and appoint a new Archbishop of Canterbury. For this they elected Hubert Walter. Richard and John's mother, Eleanor, continued to oversee matters and ensure there was a peace in the kingdom, and she worked to raise the enormous figure for Richard's release. In July 1193, a figure was finally settled upon. The Emperor, Henry VI, had paid the Archduke of Austria 50,000 marks to hand over Richard, and now he doubled his money with 100,000 marks being the eventual figure received. Heavy contributions to raising the ransom was made by the church, with the clergy donating some of their personal income. The larger churches in England donated their finest treasures and the nobility were also expected to contribute financially. It was a severe undertaking and would leave the country in a poorer state. When you consider the harsh taxes that Richard had imposed for his crusade, this latest demand would have been economically very crippling. Richard was finally released in early 1194, but not before a deal was made on how the ransom was to be paid. Hostages were handed over to the emperor until a sizable portion had been paid, and Henry VI also demanded that Richard acknowledged him as his overlord. Very little regard was given to that though, as the king had only done this under duress. Richard returned to England briefly before he turned his attentions back to his old nemesis, Philip II. Having got wind of his brother's attempts to keep him in Germany, Richard met John and accepted his begs for forgiveness, stating that John was still only a child despite the fact that he was now well into his twenties, and actually probably about 27 at the time. Philip II also would not have been too pleased to see Richard return, and the English king now took the attack to him and invaded France. On more than one occasion, Philip beat a hasty retreat when encountered by the sight of Richard's army drawing up against him. I think it's safe to say that Philip had been left more than a little bit intimidated by Richard's efforts during the Third Crusade. After Richard made significant gains against him, a peace between the two sides, temporarily at least, broke out. The security of England didn't escape Richard's thinking either, despite his war with Philip. One of his ideas was to encourage jousting tournaments so English knights could sharpen their skills in case of foreign invasion, with him possibly being preoccupied on the continent. Between 1197 and 1198, Richard was once again preoccupied and was engaged in another struggle with Philip over continental supremacy, and he pressed for further financial assistance. Given the burdens he had already loaded on the country and also with the fact that he was hardly ever present in England, Richard's excessive demands for financial assistance is certainly worthy of condemning and it played no little part in the disastrous reign to follow. A medieval king's duty was not simply to make great military conquests but it was also to think about the future of the dynasty that he was now a part of. Richard produced no heirs, so left a contested throne and left England in a dire financial state.
1198, Richard was enraged by the Bishop of Lincoln's refusal to grant further aid to the king. Richard was on the back foot with Philip now, with the French king having stronger forces and resources at his disposal. But the church had already made generous donations to the king's cause, and the Philip and the bishop refused to burden it any further with a foreign war. The only way he would have accepted Richard's demands is if he had actually been for the defence of England. Tensions between the bishop and the king grew, and it was requested that the bishop should travel to see Richard. After a period of Richard having a childlike sulk, the bishop eventually won him over, and Richard lodged the bishop at his stunning new castle at Chateau Gaillard. In 1199, Richard was laying siege to a castle when he was struck by an arrow. Mortally wounded, he was carried to his bed. The perpetrator was brought before him where he was asked to justify his actions. The young man responsible replied that his father had died whilst at war with Richard and stated that he was simply getting revenge. Richard seems to have been impressed by the response and asked for his attacker to be released. His soldiers didn't comply with this wish, however, and the young man was hanged. Richard died of his injuries soon after. To sum up Richard, he was an extraordinary military leader and a king completely unique in English history in the sense of what he accomplished during the Third Crusade. He has to be regarded as the finest of all warrior kings during the medieval period. <clears throat> However, as king of England, you could hardly call him a great king. He paid little to no attention to the future of his father's dynasty. He left the country in an economically difficult situation. He had left no heirs of his own and spent little time in England, less than six months possibly. It has to be said that England was simply not his priority.